Good morning. Welcome to the Community Church of Glen Rock on this Sunday morning. The following are today's announcements. Just a reminder that today we continue, even though it's All Saints Day, we continue our stewardship month. Um, We've got a lot in store next Sunday. For those of you that haven't seen the announcements, next Sunday, November 8th, we are going to have our Stewardship Sunday, the close of our stewardship month. And at that time, we will be offering many different ways for you to explore giving at this church. Uh, We will start with a missions breakfast at 8.30 in the morning in Fellowship Hall. That will uh, go towards, all proceeds will go towards a mission trip that's being planned for June of 2016. During the service, there'll be a second collection for those of you who prefer to make their pledge donation at the service itself. There'll be a second collection during the service for that. And afterwards, back in Fellowship Hall, we are going to be having a program ministry fair where you can uh, find out different ways that you can give back to this church uh, through the program life and ministries here at the Community Church of Glen Rock. That's all next Sunday, November 8th. A reminder today that the second collection will go towards the South Carolina Food Relief also, if, if you weren't aware of it, Madeline Berry is going to be taking uh, families in the church school, taking them to the Wildlife Center in Wyckoff. So if you're interested in doing that, that's going to happen today after the service about 11.30 a.m., right, Madeline? 11.30 a.m. this morning. Uh, please, if you haven't done so, please... Take a moment to fill out the guest book here. If you're a member, there's, there's a place for you to enter any of your concerns that you might have. And if you're new to this church, haven't been here before, please fill it out. It's not so that we can uh, stalk you. It's so that we can fill you in on some of the information, some of the things that are happening here at the church. Uh, a reminder also as well for Sunday, November 15th. Sunday, November 15th at 4.30 in the afternoon will be my installation here at the church. I hope that all of you can make it. The reason why I bring it is bring that up, though, is not only because of that, but because of an announcement that Joanne Jennings would like me to make and share with you, and that is that she and uh, Donna Nian are still in need of people who are going to be baking finger food desserts. So if you want to get involved, please talk to Joanne or Donna, and I'm sure they'd be happy to have your, your support. Lastly, anybody who would like to become a member of this church, this is a dynamic congregation. There's a lot going on here, a lot to offer at this church. So If you've been coming here for 40 years or if you've been coming here for four days, please consider becoming a member of the Community Church of Glen Rock. The way you get started is see myself or one of the members of consistory after the service. We'll get you pointed in the right direction. These are the announcements of the day. Now let us continue with worship. Our help is in the name of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Glorious God, we come together as your people. We come as a hungry people, longing to be fed. We come as a journeying people, looking for direction. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Grace to you and peace from God, our Creator, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Won't you join me in the prayer of confession, which can be found inside your bulletins? Holy God, we know that you created us in love to enjoy this world and you, to serve your creation and your children. And we know that we do not do your will. With clenched hands, we can neither give nor receive. With eyes tightly shut, we cannot see pain or beauty. With feet of clay, we cannot dance in joy or run to help. We ask for your help and your power to change. Open our hands and eyes, move our feet toward grace and hope and trust in you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are not broken to the point that we cannot be made whole once again. God works through all of us. God is working to bring healing and wholeness. Restoration is always possible. Renewal is always possible. Forgiveness is always available. Lord, let your love always be present and let us live with this good news. And what else does God say? As God's forgiven people, how are we to live? Hear now the word of God. He has told you what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God.
The peace of Christ be with you. Let us take a moment now to share the sign of peace with one another.
At this time, I'd like to invite all the children up to the chancel for the children's message. Come on up, everybody. How's everyone doing? I've got to start getting some of the names here. That's to start learning all your names. How's everybody doing? Pretty good? You still have some of the Halloween design on there, huh? (laughs) All right. So before I start with my children's message, I have one quick question. How was your Halloween? Good? Did you have... Oh, here we go. There's the rest of them. Okay. And did you get lots of, lots of candy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll bet you did. I know. Well, listen, uh, I want to know from all of you, how many of you know uh, when you're happy and you know it? If you're happy and you know it, the song. Yeah. Right? If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will really show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Right? Something like that. Well, what do you think if it was a bird? What would it be? If if a bird was happy, what would the bird do? It could be. What else? I know. Every direction. What? Over here. Over here. Yeah. In the gray sweatshirt or next to the gray sweatshirt. Sorry, I thought it was... Chirp? Chirp, could be a chirp, or how about could be the wings, right? If you're happy and you know it, flap your wings. What do you think it would be if it were a dog? What would a dog do? Wag its tail, maybe. Wag its tail, that's right. Well, you know what? What did you want to say? Wag the tail, that's right. That's, that's excellent. That's probably what the dog would do because we see dogs in there, when they're happy, they wag their tail. And it reminds me about a little puppy. A little puppy that once was really happy and the puppy noticed that his tail was wagging. So the puppy thought that he had found the secret to happiness. Happiness was in his tail. So he told an older dog that that he had found happiness and happiness was in his tail and he was going to chase his tail until he caught it and when he caught it, he'd be happy. And the the older dog said, well, I agree that, that happiness is really important and that happiness is in the tail, but I find that whenever I chase my tail, my tail runs away from me. And so God wants us to be happy as well. God wants us to be happy, but happiness isn't in a new car, a new house, or a lot of money, or, or best friends with, with someone at school. Happiness is somebody who trusts in God. And so a lot of us, a lot of us are like the puppies. A lot of us are like the puppies chasing happiness, thinking that, that one day we'll be happy. But we need to remember that we can always be happy if we only trust in God. Let's bow our heads and say a quick prayer. Heavenly God, we thank you for being a part of our lives. Help us to trust you more in everything that we say or do. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen. And the people all said, You are my beloved child. All right, now the pre K through second grade are going off to church school. The rest of you back to your seats.
I saw that, that hesitation moment from a few of them thinking, wait a minute, am I in pre-K through second grade or am I in the older group going back to their seats? But they figured it all out. As you know, today we continue our Stewardship Month, and each Sunday during Stewardship Month, we have someone from the church telling you a little bit, little bit about what the church means to them and how they've been able to give back. And so today I'd like to invite up Bob Crowlin to share a few of, of his thoughts. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I have some good news for you. I spoke with my wife this morning. She said, are you talking? And I said, yes. She said, keep it short. <laughs> so, uh, and then she said, don't tell people I said that. <laughs> which, uh, which, before I could tell you what this church means to me, uh, I've got to preface it with how I got here now. Uh, so indulge me if you would, I'll keep it short. Um, when I was 10 years old, my grandfather was a very pious, religious person, okay, uh, to his religion. And uh, in 1944, when I was 10 and my sister was 5, my mother died. When your mother dies when you're 10, you look for answers and there really aren't any. Uh, God, how can, you, how can you do this to me? Uh, your playmates say their mother just baked some cookies. You have no mother. And for the next 14 years, uh, God and I uh, weren't on the same page, and, uh, and I had a lot of hurt. Uh, only once, only once in 14 years, did uh, I speak with God. And this goes through uh, grammar school, and high school, and college, and then when I was in the Navy. And while I was in the Navy, I made three trips across the Atlantic to the Mediterranean, the last one lasting uh, six months. And then something happened. My enlistment was up. My ship was uh, docked in Naples, uh, Italy, and word came that I was to be discharged. My enlistment was up. First available ship going back to the United States. And I was ecstatic, okay? The time had come, and I could look forward to my life. Um, and I was assigned to the USS Diamond Head, which I had no idea what kind of ship it was. Uh, and I was transferred to the Diamond Head, who was going back to Norfolk, Virginia, and I found out that the Diamond Head was an ammunition ship. And uh, we, uh, we departed, went through the Straits of Gibraltar. Five days later, we were in the middle of the Atlantic. And there were five or six of my shipmates who were going to be discharged also. And it was evening time. We were standing at the rail, watching the waves go by, looking at the full moon, knowing that in a short week's time, we'll be back in Norfolk, Virginia. And then a couple of days later, we'd be discharged. And so we were a happy bunch of guys until we heard bong, bong, fire, fire. Now, most sailors will tell you the worst thing that can happen to them is to be at sea and have a fire. And that's really not the case. The worst thing that can happen to them is to be at sea and have a fire and be on, an, on an ammunition ship. That really scares the heck out of you. And here's where the first prayer after 14 years came in, okay? Dear God, okay, save my shipmates and myself, okay? Let this not happen. And about 30 minutes later, okay, it was all clear. It was a short in the circuit board, which gives heat senses, okay, where all the ammunition and everything else, because if this ship went, there'd be little teeny pieces of us all over the place. And... This started my road back to God and eventually to here. And that was, I wanted you to know that. It just wasn't the normal uh, growing up, going to church, and, and 
finding a place. Good news started happening right after that, okay? I was discharged in October of 1957. In December, I was introduced to my future. Nancy Oliver of Atlanta, Georgia, okay? And we started dating then, and 11 months later, we were married. 11 months. And as of uh, the installation date of Reverend O'Brien, which happens to be November 15th, it'll be 57 years. So I just wanted you to know that. Uh, 11 months after that, our first child came, and here's where the process to get to community church came in. One day I came home from work. It was in February. It was a stormy day. It was dark out early, and Nancy said, uh, by the way, the, the minister from community church is going to stop by tonight. And I said, oh, geez. <laughs> you know, I really wanted to relax. Well, we, we have to look and, and try to get uh, Karen, ba or, uh, Karen baptized. And I looked out the window, and it was snowing, and the wind was blowing the snow sideways. And I said, this guy's not showing up. <laughs> well, at 7 o'clock, the appointed time, okay, the bell rang at Chandler Drive in Fairlawn. This man in a black hat, black coat, Dr. Melvin Ogle, showed up, came upstairs, and I said, any guy that comes out on a blizzard to talk to, to us, okay, it can't be too bad. So we talked and talked, and uh, the problem was that I wasn't baptized. So he baptized me, and then he baptized Karen. Years later, Karen was married in this church, and I started to get more relaxed with religion. That brought me to here. And what does it mean to me? Well, I tell you, we all have anxieties. We all have problems, work, social, you name it, friends. And one of the things on Sundays is I come into this building. I speak with my mom and dad. I'm relaxed. All the bad vibes leave my body. And I leave here a better place, a better person. And I mean that with all my heart. It took a false alarm on a Navy ship for me to find my God again. And I found it, and I celebrate it in this church. Last Sunday, one of the hymns was Jesus, the very thought of thee. And while I was singing it, there was one sentence that stood out, and I said, this sums it up. And I'm quoting now. A sweeter sound than that thy blessed name, O Savior of us all. With all my heart, I believe that to be true. I consider the people of this church, my brothers and sisters, all of us. And for that, I'm humbly grateful. Okay, may God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob, for sharing your thoughts. And, and uh, again, it's just a wonderful, wonderful community, and it's great to have you all a part of it. Thanks, Bob.
Will you pray with me? <clears throat> God, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will. Amen. The scripture this morning is from the gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord. Today is All Saints Day. And it's ironic that it should always fall the day after Halloween. Yesterday you likely saw all kinds of costumes. There were the dark characters, Draculas, vampires, and ghosts. There were the warriors of some sort, power rangers, ninjas, superheroes. But not all the costumes were scary. There were the happy characters as well, fairies, princesses, and ballerinas. And there were a fair share of animals, gorillas, lions, and tigers. Tell me, though. Did you happen to see anybody dressed up as their favorite saint? I didn't think so. And for good reason. There's a great deal of confusion about the meaning of the word saint. This misunderstanding is due in part to movies about the Roman Catholic canonization of saints as well as interest in books about the lives of the saints and painted pictures or memorabilia of the saints as icons. In short, I believe the saints have an identity crisis, a serious identity crisis. Ask a dozen people who the saints are, and you'll likely get a dozen different answers. The truth is, the response you get depends on what part of history one adheres to. In the first 300 years of church history, a saint was someone who got killed for Christ. They were the martyrs of the church. To qualify for sainthood in the first 300 years of church history, you had to be killed for Jesus Christ. Christians were killed by by lions or, or burnt at the stake in the Colosseum in Rome. That is how you became a saint. Any takers? Then things changed in the year 313. The Roman Emperor Constantine made it official that every saint had to be a Christian. 
He wasn't doing it for religious purposes, no. Instead, he was using Christianity as the glue that would hold his empire together. So what was a saint at that time? The Roman Catholic Church had great power then, and what they did was canonize famous people who had died and made them saints. The church built a chapel in their honor, and you would enter that chapel, light votive candles, and pray to that saint. Praying to the saints who could intercede to God on your behalf was very important to the medieval Roman Catholic religion. These saints had the ear of God in heaven, so we down on earth would pray to the saints. For 1,300 years, saints were the dead religious heroes who were up in heaven, close to the ear of God. Then came the Reformation in the early 16th century. Martin Luther and all the other reformers questioned the papal authority in Rome. They didn't like the idea of praying to and through the saints. You don't have to get some saint to pray for you. You can pray directly to God. So during the Reformation, the meaning of saints changed. The saints then began to refer to our our Christian loved ones, who had died and gone to be with God before us. Saints referred to our our friends and family members who had died, mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, brothers and sisters. These people all went to heaven and were now up there with God. About a hundred years ago, about a hundred years ago, things changed again, and they started making lists of people in the congregation who died in the past year and published those names. Other definitions of a saint have come to light since. There are those who say that a saint is someone who puts up with a really unbearable person. I guess that makes my wife a saint. Some might even say that a a saint is a member of a New Orleans football team. Seriously, though, seriously, the point is, when we talk about saints, we're not just talking about those who have departed, the dearly departed. In all the identities of who the saints are, you'll notice two things in common. First, it would appear that becoming a saint has been getting easier and easier over the course of history. From burned at the stake and fed to the lions to simply having died. Secondly, not one of these definitions comes from the Bible. So how does the Bible define and describe a saint? After all, the mark of a Christian church is a congregation that is Bible-centered, right? The word saint is never single. The Bible never says St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, St. John. The word is never singular. It's always plural, like in the hymn, for all the saints. The word saints means God's holy ones. We are God's holy people, and we are called holy not because we ourselves are holy, but because God is holy and we are associated with God. The Bible uses saints to talk about the faithful, all the faithful, not just those who have gone on to meet their maker. In reality, a saint is simply a person living or dead, that God has chosen for eternal life and upon whom God has shared his grace. They include those of us who are here now, still busy living out our faith. All Saints Day is therefore not just a time to think about the deceased, but also about the living, all the saints. A person is a saint not because they have lived a a life of 
Mother Teresa or Francis of Assisi. It's not when you have chalked up a certain number of divine accomplishments. You can't use your advantage card and get divinity points. It doesn't work that way. No, it's when you allow God to be in control of your life. A person is a saint whenever they live their life in the way that God wants them to live it right here and now. I remember I remember being given a St. Christopher medal when I was about six years old. Wow! I figured you must have to be ancient and flawless in order to be a saint and have a medal made in your honor. Unbelievable. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this pedestal that our Christian culture places on sainthood can create adverse and unattainable expectations in our lives. There was a time in my life when I was consumed with thoughts of whether or not I would go to heaven. Was I doing what I should be doing? How can I lead a life that would put me on track towards heaven? What would I do if I didn't get to heaven? Society teaches us to live our lives without reference to God. Everything is within our own control, our own decisions, our own actions. It was only natural that I should be able to tack tackle this problem as well on my own. Adding to the impossibility of my dilemma, heaven to me was this mythical afterlife that was so far removed from my existence. At some point later, though, I I came to realize that all my concerns were centered on me and not God. What should I? How can I? What would I? I, I, I. Eventually, my focus became centered on God. What does God want of my life? Where is God in my life? Who is God? It was only when, it was only then that I was able to to stop this vicious and unending cycle of worry. How we are associated with God is the key. If we are to be connected with God, we must be faithful disciples of Christ. And we are given probably the greatest piece of writing on how to do that in the Sermon on the Mount. At the heart of the Sermon on the Mount are the core teachings of Jesus that were to be passed on to his followers. And we can find the best set of instructions for us in the Beatitudes from our Gospel reading today. It is within these teachings that Jesus outlines the ideal characteristics of Christian living. Jesus sets the standards by which we need to live our lives. The Beatitudes say a great deal about our faith, and we could spend a sermon on each one of them. Suffice it to say, though, that when we live our lives according to them, we become one of God's saints. All Saints Day celebrates those whose way of living suggests that we can be at our best. Their stories remind us of who we are, what we believe, and what we can become. They advise us how closely a human being can follow the example of Jesus. They lead us forward, give us courage, strengthen us to do God's will, and set a course for all of us. Their good examples remind us that God reaches out to us with grace and love and care. What is a saint? A saint is a person who got killed for Christ in the first three centuries. What is a saint? Those people 
who were the religious heroes of the church, had chapels and churches built in their honor, and are now up in heaven interceding on our behalf with God. What is a saint? Our friends and family, grandmothers and grandfathers, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters who have died and gone before us into heaven. What is a saint? Someone who has died this past year in the life of the church. What is a saint? You and me. We are the living saints of God. We are God's holy people. And no costumes are needed. Let us pray. Heavenly God, we thank you for all the saints in our lives, those who came before us and those here with us today, who continue to be an example of the right relationship with you. For you are the Prince of Peace. You are the Anointed One. You are our hope and salvation, who lives and reigns forever. Amen. The saints of old <clears throat> don't wear golden crowns or sit on a lofty perch lamenting how poorly we measure up to the glory of days past. They too knew about keeping hope alive while getting dinner on the table, faucets fixed and budgets balanced. They endured wistful nights and wasted days. They had knees that ate in the cold weather and sometimes even spoke sharp words. You don't get to custom design the witness you bear, the woe you endure, or the promises you make to mend the world as it crosses your path. By and large, you weigh the choices that come your way without the fanfare, the spotlight, your picture in the paper, or even angels whispering in your ear. Saintly work is more common than you think. Please join me now in the litany of the saints. For all the saints who have gone before us, God, we give thanks for our ancestors in the faith. For all the saints who have been beloved to us, For all the saints who have left us too soon. For all the saints who have exemplified the faithful life. On this day, we name those who we lost in this past year. Irma Brown, Elizabeth Vandenberg, Alberta Defa. Ralph Haslinger, Elder Francis, Richard Strickland, Harold Mapes, Harry Von Kirk, Marion Pomeroy, Sally Bizard, Nicole Nelson, Betty Ryan, Jesse Richards, William Perkins, Jean Erme, Helen H. Levermore, and Virginia Nian, for all the saints, God, both living and deceased, we give you thanks. This morning's offerings will now be received.
we give thanks for all we have received, God, gifts of love and time, money and abilities. Into these plates, we return a portion of these gifts. Bless those who receive them, just as we are blessed in sharing them. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the supper which we are about to celebrate is a feast of remembrance, communion, and hope. Christ invites all who believe to this table so that we may experience wholeness while seeking peace with one another. We welcome all. So come, not because you must, but come because you may. Come to this table not because you are strong, but because you seek God's strength. Come to this table with all your broken pieces, seeking wholeness, trusting in Jesus. Come and enjoy the feast that God has prepared for us today. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy and right it is, and our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places, O Lord, our Creator, Almighty and Everlasting God. You created heaven with all its hosts and the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being and preserve us by your providence, but you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, the eternal Word made flesh for us and for our salvation, for the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you. We praise and bless you, O God, with your whole church on earth and with all the company of heaven. We worship and adore your glorious name. Most righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by your Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Together we proclaim the mystery of faith. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took a loaf of bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, 
This is my body which is given up for you. After they had eaten, he took a cup, gave it to the disciples, saying, This is the cup of the new and everlasting covenant made possible by my life and death. Whenever you drink from it, do so in remembrance of me.
The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Brothers and sisters, since the Lord has now fed us at his table, let us praise God's holy name with heartfelt thanksgiving. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. For God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all and will also give us all things with him. This morning, as we enter into our moment of silence. I ask that you pray to be open to the will of God in your life. Let us bow our heads in prayer. God, we pray, let us be open to your presence in our lives. Each of us is our own unique person, but, but we are all here to serve you, O oh Lord. Let your plan for each of us unfold in our lives. Help us. Help us to break down the barriers, the armor that we have created to shield us from life itself. Let your will penetrate our hearts and let us let us become your saints, the love of Christ active in this world right here and now. God, we realize that world is not perfect by any means, nor are we ourselves. Forgive us when we say or act in unloving ways, when our lack of, lack of giving harms others and brings unrest to your creation. We pray that you will let peaceful minds prevail. Bring us back to a caring and compassionate way of living. Let the love that you have placed in our hearts be shared with others in the community as we go about our lives. Bless the town of Glenrock as we feel the effects of the difficult e economic times. We pray for leaders of our nations Help them. Help them to find solutions to the injustices that plague this earth. We ask that you let your peace, which surpasses all understanding, reign throughout the world. And now, God, we pray that you will bless the individuals, families, and loved ones on our prayer list, as well as the loved ones and family members of the 224 that were killed on the Russian plane crash in the Sinai. Let your light shine on those we have offered up by name and on, on those who are unmentioned but remain etched in our hearts. We ask these things through the prayer your son taught us to pray. <clears throat> 